Good afternoon, everyone, uh, and welcome to Grand Rounds today, the 29th of May. It's Friday, which is, puts everyone a little bit out of whack. Um, of course, Grand Rounds is usually on a Thursday, but I suppose one of the benefits of doing this virtually is that um, that when your speaker is not available on the Thursday, because he's off doing something else, and we can uh, rearrange it to, to a Friday. So welcome. I, I see a sea of faces in front of me. We currently have 66 participants, which is fantastic. I see a mix of people from primary and secondary care. Some people have gathered together in bigger rooms, some in smaller rooms. Um, it's really nice to be able to see you all. Um, the, we're recording this. Uh, last week's Grand Round was recorded and uploaded to YouTube without much of a hitch. So if you want to know about the nociception and uh, driving and controlling pain, from you and St. John Smith uh, from Cambridge last week. It is on the YouTube channel, go look at that. It's a fascinating talk, uh, delivered, um, uh, delivered really well. Not everything is about COVID, but quite a lot of it is about COVID. So what we're, we're having a COVID-centric uh, talk this week. And uh, the COVID team have been doing regular m and and educational meetings all the way through the pandemic. But we thought it'd be helpful, useful, or just interesting for the people who've not been so um, embedded in the COVID work to find out what kind of thing we've been up to. Um, and that will include some information on the setup of the COVID unit from Susan Bean, our clinical group manager. David Connell is going to talk about something or other, probably some cases. And then one of our trainees, Brian Doherty, is going to talk about the audit work that's being done. But before we do that, I'm pleased to welcome as part of the operational update, uh, Tom, another Tom, who's going to talk, hopefully, if he's there, and I have to admit, I've not seen him yet on the screen, um, he's going to talk about the modelling data that they've been working on to tell us what's going to happen now that we're coming out of lockdown. Now, is Tom there? Yes, hi there. Hi, can you share your screen, Tom? Yeah, will do. Okay, super, I'll leave it in your hands. Uh, give me a second to work this out. Okay. There he is. I've seen you now. Is that working? That's right. If you just um, just press go on your on your presentation, we should be fine. Uh, oops, excuse me. So, are you seeing the first slide? Uh, we, we can see the first slide and and all the other bits and pieces. So, if you just go to oh, presentation really? slideshow and start your then we'll it'll be like a normal presentation. Okay, excuse me. I will. Uh, I might stop this and reshare. Um, how's that? That's perfect. Thanks you very much. I'll, I'll leave you to introduce who you are and what you do, um, and then I'll be back in a bit. Okay, thank you very much. Um, so, thank you for inviting me to speak today. My name is Tom Yarosh Krumi, and I work in the business unit um, at Nine Wells. I'm the cancer information lead, but I also have a background in elective modeling, elective care planning. So since the um, pandemic outbreak, we've been working on some COVID modeling in Tayside. And we've been linking with colleagues in ISD, uh, uh, Scottish government, and um, colleagues at Strathclyde University who have been doing some work for um, the Scottish government um, in modeling uh, the pandemic outbreak in the different boards. So, uh, oh, this is frozen. Oh, here we are. So, um, I've got three models to present today. Um, we've updated them as of the last few days. So, the Scottish Government produced um, some outputs with consultation with the SAGE um, group. And they produced them at Scotland level um, with three, th three scenarios, most likely better and worse. Um, so they presented these, they shared these models with the board chief executives uh, a little while ago. Um, and all we've been able to do with these really is to apply a weighting for Tayside. So it's at, a, it's at an NHS Scotland level and we're looking at what does is, 9% what is of that look like um, for Tayside. The second model um, I'll share is 
the one developed uh, in collaboration with Public Health Scotland, Strathclyde University, and uh, input from Scottish Government, or support from Scottish Government. Um, and this is a SEER model, uh, uh, susceptible, exposed, infected, and uh, recovered uh, model. And the um, academic at Strathclyde has produced a number of percentiles. So there's a median prediction first and third quartiles and uh, some uh, a higher and a lower uh, centile as well. This one's based on midnight occupancy. The Scottish Government is based on weekly admissions. And then the third uh, version is an NHS Tayside version of uh, another SEER model that was shared um, by a colleague in Dumfries and Galloway. So the advantage with the third one is that we are able to plug in Tayside specific parameters and to change uh, these parameters on a daily basis and to start doing some forecasting. So the first slide um, is from the Scottish Government model. It's quite a basic model. Um, it's looking at admissions per week to general inpatient wards and admissions to ICU. So the dotted line uh, is the prediction and the solid line are the NHS Tayside actuals. Um, so you can see that the dotted line for uh, admissions to hospital is quite a way off uh, our actual experience for both general inpatient admissions and for ICU admissions. And this is the most likely scenario that the Scottish Government produced, weighted at 9% for Tayside. And this is the better scenario. So this is a better case scenario where um, across the board, the um, acute measures are lower. Uh, and you can see that the better scenario matches to our actual experience a little bit better, both for uh, hospital admissions and for ICU admissions. So this model hasn't really been updated much since it was released. Um, and at the moment we are tracking um, against this model. We're not really using this for predictions at the moment, other than to um, sense check actuals against the predictions in this model. So the next one I want to share with you is the collaborative model developed with Strathclyde University and Public Health Scotland. Public Health Scotland is the new name of ISD. Some of you might be familiar with ISD. So in this model, the blue line is the median predicted hospital occupancy on a daily basis, running from mid-March through to early June. The two black dotted lines are first and third quartiles, and the dotted gray are the 2.5 centile and the 97.5 centile. The bars are our actual hospital occupancy uh, at midnight on each of these days. So there's been a number of refinements of this model to and fro. Um, so now the model is based on confirmed COVID cases. Uh, initially it was on confirmed and query cases. So we now have it only on confirmed cases. Um, and this model is refreshed and updated every week. So this is the latest version. If I focus in on where we are matching best, uh, and that's at the 2.5 centile and the, 90, and the uh, first quartile. The first quartile is the 25th percentile, as you probably know. So we're a reasonable... Um, match in terms of the pattern, although it looks like uh, the prediction of the outbreak is, is a week later. So we've uh, had a look at what this would look like if we shift the outbreak to a week earlier, the prediction curve, and uh, it certainly looks like a pretty good fit for the 2.5 centile on this model. Um, that, that means that's a really low end of the estimate. So the shape looks good, but the volume um, doesn't really look representative. Um, 
And this is an iterative model and we are backwards and forwards with uh, the team on developing this. So for the moment, we're getting a good agreement at the 2.5 centile um, with the shape. And similar to the Scottish government model, model um, you can see that the tail is continuing to decrease um, as we go through into early June. So this is a, a, a table of the R values that have been calculated based on confirmed cases. Um, so based on testing strategy um, in each board. Uh, and this is the R value that is being used in the model. So about 10 days ago, the R value for taste side had been estimated at about 1.06. So way above everyone else, um, and we think that that was clearly because of the testing regime in Tayside. So this week, the revision has, we think, included our testing regime. I've asked a question of the team whether they are basing the R value on, whether they have rebased the R value on hospital admissions, or if they're still basing it on, on the testing regime. But you can see that we are, um, well, we've halved the, the R value over the course of those 10 days. And, um, and that's clearly, that's not real. Um, that, that's a rebasing of the model. Um, so the Scotland average is about 0.6 at the moment, and, and uh, we're around about 0.54. So that's um, where we are with the Strathclyde University collaborative model. Uh, and I'd like to share uh, the local modeling that we've been doing. So this has been a collaborative locally between our public health department, uh, the uh, HBI team in the business unit and uh, myself. So the IR model from Dumfries allowed you to plug in all of the parameters uh, and tweak and update and run scenarios. So we've got a, a pretty decent fit on this model for daily predictions, daily admissions to hospital. So these are acute admissions to inpatient beds in hospital. And the estimated R for this model is 0 0.6. So that is starting to line up much better with uh, the Strathclyde model. So we think that we're starting to get a decent bit of confidence around this. Uh, and in common, uh, when I predict when I project this uh, out to into June and the end of June, this line continues to um, decay. Hospital admissions continue to decay. Hospital occupancy continues to decay. So the advantage with this model is that we can now start to plug in um, what we think might happen to the R value based on uh, phase one, two, three of the um, release of lockdown, um, and that is the modelling that we will be getting into in the coming weeks. We haven't presented any of our ideas at the moment because we, we're just guessing at the moment. So we're gonna wait and see what the data does and, and then start running some scenarios based on this local model. Um, and that's really what I have for you today. Um, it's a snapshot of what we've done so far and a little bit about what we're going to be doing in the next uh, weeks. So I guess, um, it's over to questions. Shall I stop sharing? Or would you like me to put it back up? Oh, sorry, I was muted. Um, if anyone has any questions, if you could um, direct them towards me in the chat box, just select me from the down from the um, uh, from the selection box, and, and I'll then be able to direct the questions at the end of end of grand rounds. Um, thanks to Tom for that, which is a, a really nice description of of, of what, what we've come through and what what we're going to what we can expect. What we're going to move to now is Susan. Is Susan there? We'll start with me, and then all right. We... We're not starting with Susan. She disappeared. Okay, we're going to start with Dave Connell instead, and. Um, I'm a bit out of whack now, so I don't know what Dave's going to talk about, but Dave Connell is one of the consultant chess positions here in uh, NHS Taser in Nine Wells, who's been heavily involved in the COVID effort, and particularly with uh, uh, audit and quality control work. 
um, he's been really driving force and getting the trainees to do a lot of quality improvement work here in the COVID unit. So uh, he's, uh, he's done some fantastic work. So he's going to talk about there and back again, A Hobbit's Tale. Oh, well done, Tom. You found a literary reference. So, um, no, I'm just introducing the Grand Run to begin with, and Susan will come in in a second. So, yeah, I thought I'd put a literary reference in there, and Tom's already spotted it, because uh, what we're about to describe is a bit of a quest. Um, it uh, involves, you know, excitement and adventure. It doesn't involve a dragon, but, of course, there could be a part two, which uh, the modelling team may be able to tell us about at some later stage. Um, so... Yeah, I thought I'd just do a, a quick in, introduction just to remind everyone that um, there was a time before coronavirus and this was a timeline, this is a timeline showing what happened and when in China, but also this is the ProMed release from the very first ProMed email post when they started to discuss an unexplained pneumonia in Wuhan in China, that was on uh, the 30th of December 2019. So before that date, no, nobody had a clue of what was about to happen. We thought 2020 was going to be all about Brexit. It might still be about Brexit, but, at, but it's so far been, a, been about coronavirus. And you can see that this timeline um, uh, takes us to around February. And what we are going to talk about is really what's happened since then. Um, and with that, I'll hand over to Susan and she will talk about the early part and the organization of the coronavirus response here in TASE. Thanks, Susan. Oh, we just spoke over at a socially distanced um, yeah, appropriate space. You to move it on, you're gonna press, you're gonna move it on the arrow there. Yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah. okay, firstly, thanks very much everybody for having me. Grand Rounds isn't usually the uh, territory of managers, so bear with me. Ah, it's gone. They broke it, sorry. Yeah, press that arrow. That one, okay, yeah. lovely. Um, so I'm Susan, I'm one of the clinical care group managers in medicine, and I've had the joy for the last few months of working alongside the COVID team, um, particularly on the early stages of our COVID response in Tayside. Um, I'm also pleased that Dr. Cornell clarified at the start there, I'm not the dragon in the story, so that's, <laughs> that's helpful. Um, as we said, pre-December um, 2019, nobody had heard of coronavirus. Um, so it's quite difficult to believe now. Um, and here is the timeline of our very early response in Tayside. So um, lesson number one of a pandemic for me was beware the clinical lead that comes to your office saying, I think there's something you should know about. Um, the 23rd of January, a student in Dundee who had links to Wuhan, unbeknown to us, presented at a GP practice in the area, um, showing symptoms of this unusual novel coronavirus that we hadn't really any experience of until that point. Thankfully that GP sought some advice from our secondary care colleagues on how best to, to manage that patient and this was the first potential patient in Tayside um, who was referred into our ID team to be tested. Um, obviously this was quite a shock to us not having anticipated we had any local links to that area and thinking the virus was some way off from Dundee um, however, on the 24th of January, realising that we had quite a, a clear and present risk locally, given that this individual was part of a much wider group who'd visited the Wuhan area, um, we thought we'd better do something that would be quite unthinkable now and get everybody all in a room and discuss how we were going to respond to this. So we convened a group, a wide multi-professional group from within medicine, um, involving obviously our ID colleagues, respiratory colleagues, our, our acute and emergency care colleagues. Um, we made it multi-agency very early on, so obviously the ambulance service were going to be critical to this. Um, our virology labs colleagues were also with us from the beginning, um, as were our critical care colleagues, as we knew that this was a, a disease that was going to involve them ultimately. Um, Recognising that there's more than one front door in nine wells, um, our paediatric and maternity colleagues were also involved in the very early discussions, and that group became effectively the early COVID-19, before it was COVID-19 task force for Tayside. Um, it was a very action focused group um, and focused on real time troubleshooting of issues um, and putting in a framework for managing something that we had never managed before. Um, we drew on our experience of managing SARS and MERS. Oh, I'm sorry, sorry. There we go. Um, as a bit of a, a starter for 10 and we tweaked it knowing what we did at the time about what was going to become COVID-19. So 
that planning group focused on action cards for areas, very simple, very easy to put in place. And um, we tried to make them as straightforward as possible. The advice at the beginning was very clear. If you find somebody that you think has this, send them to ID and we will isolate them and we will help you to deal with them there. Um, by the end of January, we had put in place some signage, much to the annoyance, I think, at points of Scottish Government, who hadn't been forthcoming with anything at that point. However, the feeling within Tayside very early on was that stay-at-home message. We knew the best way to keep um, our staff and our patients safe was actually to keep them at home if they didn't need to be in an acute hospital. Um, and the response was very much focused on an unwell person coming into hospital and how we would manage them safely and appropriately. And that took up most of the end of January. Um, by the end of January also, we had seen three patients into Nine Wells for testing. At that early point, um, those patients were conveyed into Nine Wells by the SORT team who are the Special Operations Response Unit of the Scottish Ambulance Service and the chaps that were in spacesuits. Um, even the patients who were well, they, they came in via SORT through the back door of East Block up toward 42, where our staff would put them in a negative pressure room and test them while wearing full FFP3 um, PPE. Prior to the end of January, into the ID registrars, who became an invaluable source of, of knowledge and expertise for teams, um, helping them to pull together their plans who did a number of walk rounds in Nine Wells um, to support areas to pull together their action cards. Um, they walked around paediatrics, maternity and our acute front door areas to, to help those clinical teams to bring together their plans for managing a potential um, COVID-19 patient. Um, moving into February, we drilled a number of our plans. So some of them were tested by default um, with query COVID-19 patients presenting in areas and having to exercise those plans and see how they worked for departments. The departments who hadn't found themselves in that situation, we ran drills to make sure that the plans actually did work in practice. Um, a lot of work went on with the states during that time. It was quite clear at the beginning of this that we actually weren't 100% sure um, how the fabric of our building was set up to manage a large number of infected patients when we thought at that point we were dealing with an airborne pathogen. So there was a significant amount of work between our ID team and our state's colleagues around mapping the Nine Wells site, the negative pressure capabilities and the air changes and the ventilation in a number of different rooms so that we could build that into the risk assessment of the, the patient pathways. Um, as I mentioned, right from the outside, the message in Tayside has been stay at home if you don't need to come to hospital. So the direction of bringing in well patients to be tested in Ward 42 didn't sit particularly comfortable with us. Um, as such, Meg Park, our, our lead nurse in elective medicine and one of our infection control nurse colleagues um, set about establishing a team to home test patients um, in conjunction with their virology um, colleagues and our medical teams here. Uh, they came up with a process to be able to do that safely, which meant that we could minimise the exposure of these patients um, coming out into their cars and into the hospital. That model became operational on the 10th of February. At that point, um, also, we managed to be able to test possible COVID-19 samples in Scotland. Until then, the samples have been going to Collindale. Um, but around the middle of February, Glasgow and Edinburgh also be able to test for us. Um, our initial signs were updated around the 12th of February, following updated HPS guidance. HPS guidance, we found pattern, um, often came out late on a Friday night and catalyzed a bit of a hive of activity, making sure that everybody was aware of the changing definitions. Um, and I think that was most of February. So home testing was really successful. And um, the staff were pulled from all over Tayside. They trained in Ward 42 with the expert guidance of the, the ID team around PPE and around swabbing technique to make sure that they were able to get a, a good sample from the patients. Our virology colleagues were extremely helpful in um, obviously setting up safe systems to transport those samples and to get them back to the lab in a timely fashion. Um, and moving into March, it began proper on the 1st of March. We had our first positive patient in Scotland and that positive patient was a resident of Tayside. Um, the patient was admitted to hospital but not admitted to hospital here. 
and the planning for a potential COVID positive patient coming into the system kicked up a gear with the knowledge that actually now the, the bug was in the local area. So on the 2nd of March as a medicine team, we, we pulled our, our staff together just to make sure that everybody knew that um, we did, we did have a positive patient in the area. There was no immediate need to, to worry or do anything hugely different, but we wanted to make sure that everyone knew what their plan was. They knew how to, how to join and off their PPE safely. Um, they knew what the occupational health guidance was for staff. At that point, we were still very focused on travel definition. So we wanted to make absolutely sure that, uh, that staff who had been traveling, who were potentially at risk, knew what they needed to do and knew how to seek advice. Um, we also focused on ward movement at that time, which looking back on it seems quite, um, quite prudent. So the, the back routes between wards were put out of bounds. We encouraged people to use the proper doors in and out. We encouraged people not to take shortcuts um, and to stick to the main, the main corridors to try and minimise any risk of transmission by taking shortcuts through the back of wards. Um, at this point, we did have a COVID footprint in Nine Wells. We were still very much using 42 as our um, infectious diseases ward and, and everywhere else was functioning as normal. Um, later on in March brought, brought more local positive cases as we were expecting um, and on the 11th of March there was a, a strategic NHS Tayside wide meeting. Um, my ID colleagues have referred to this at times as the second day one. So we had our day one back in January. I think this was day one for many other places in the organisation who perhaps hadn't been exposed to the um, coronavirus discussions up until that point. So again, a huge amount of work was catalysed at that meeting. Um, that really spawned the whole operational response and the redesign of Nine Wells um, to be able to facilitate what we thought could be uh, hugely significant numbers of COVID positive unwell patients. Um, looking at the footprint, looking at the routes in and out of the building and looking at the proximity to the isolation facility in Ward 42, the decision was made on the 11th of March that the East Block Chest Clinic would become the, the COVID front door, if you like, for Nine Wells uh, for the whole of Tayside um, and patients would be signposted to that area that would separate the streams of patients and potentially or hopefully minimise the risk of transmission to the rest of the hospital population. Um, if you're not familiar with the, the geography of East Block, it, it sits down the back of the hospital, it has access for ambulances, it sits just underneath Ward 42 and it's got the, the floor space to um, manage a, a patient flow and an assessment function. Um, I've broken the next two days down into a little bit more detail because they wouldn't all fit on the big slide. So following the decision on the Wednesday, on the Thursday, the whole of the East Block inhabitants were decanted. So around 50 staff lived down in East Block, uh, ourselves included. Um, we entirely emptied the area of clinical and clerical function. We found accommodation for everybody either on or off the nine mile site or we sent people home. Um, the pulmonary function lab decanted and moved and all of the outpatient activity that had happened down here was either relocated or deferred. Um, our teams worked together amazingly over that time. We had not only a consultant rota but a registrar rota for 24 hour cover for this brand new assessment unit completed that day. Um, allowing us to staff a separate COVID possible or COVID positive take to keep those patients out of the main hospital circulation, to keep them safe while we determine their, their COVID status and also to keep the rest of our patients safe. Um, we identified an HDU facility. Ward 17, which is on level five in Nine Wells, was emptied. We were worried that we were going to run out side rooms in Ward 42 to, to isolate people. So we emptied Ward 17 to be able to overspill into there. Um, our local viro virology lab also began, um, reached the end of their QC process for their testing machines and they were able to offer us local testing um, from that day as well. And that massively improved the turnaround time for our tests, meaning that our flow through our side rooms was much slicker. Um, and just in case any of us got bored that day, Tayside also declared a, a major incident that morning in response to a road traffic accident. So that gave us something non-COVID to do for a while, which was quite nice. Um, moving into the Friday, our now empty East Block was repurposed and stopped by a 
frighteningly efficient team of our respiratory liaison nurses who begged and borrowed all the equipment that they needed from the rest of the site to make sure that our assessment unit was ready to receive patients and ready to manage those patients safely. Um, we put a system called Consultant Connect, which some of you may be familiar with, into East Block. Um, again, embodying the state home message we really really only wanted people in hospital who had to come into hospital we recognized that um, our colleagues in the ambulance service GP out of hours and other areas in acute services were possibly not as comfortable dealing with a potential COVID presentation as our experts in ID and respiratory so we put in immediate professional to professional telephone advice for them so that we could appropriately sign post patients um, both so that we could make sure that only COVID patients who needed to come to hospital came to hospital, and also so that we could try and minimise the risk of a potential COVID presentation at another one of the, the front doors. Um, because we were opening up a brand new acute front door for the hospital, we had plays with NHS 24, the Scottish Ambulance Service and our primary care colleagues, so they knew where to send people. The major trauma unit, which is attached to Ward 17, which we commandeered the day before, was emptied and repurposed as our COVID possible HDU because of its location close to our, our COVID unit. Um, our nurses worked extremely hard and updated their rosters to be able to cover a 24 hour period to be able to move the, the appropriate skills to where we needed them. Um, Ward 18 was also decanted that night in case we overspilled from 17 because at that point we really were starting to see an increased number of presentations who we were having to isolate and test. Um, and at five o'clock on the Friday night, as, as all good things are opened, um, we opened the COVID assessment unit to referrals. And over that night, um, they took 11 possible COVID referrals, patients in to be isolated and tested. But really importantly, over the course of that night, there were no potential COVID patients presented to any other part of the system, which was exactly what we wanted. And the COVID assessment unit was born. So listed on the left, in case anyone ever fancies having a go at setting up a unit themselves, is a very brief list of the things that we worked through to turn our assessment unit um, from a clinic into what was essentially uh, an acute medical receiving area. Um, as you'll see, it, it goes through quite the range of tasks. Um, and I think probably the only reason it succeeded in the time scale that it did was because small groups of action focused teams took a couple of these actions at a time and did nothing else until they were finished. Um, those teams had clear lines of escalation, they knew who to go to if they weren't getting anywhere and we just had to aim for what was good enough. So it wasn't perfect but was it safe and was it good enough to help us to manage these patient flows appropriately. We also had to do a degree of um, deciding what we, what we had to do straight away to make the unit safe to function and actually what was a nice to do but could wait for a little while longer. Um, we put up some more signs as well because it was a, another theme of our COVID response was the fact that we really quite liked a sign, especially a red one. Um, I mentioned Consultant Connect briefly in the previous slide. So since the COVID assessment unit opened on the, the 13th of March, We've taken um, over 1,800 calls. The vast majority of these are from ambulance crews. Um, I think at the very beginning, our ambulance service colleagues were really grateful for that um, expert advice at the end of the phone. It really supported them in how to safely manage patients, how to safely direct patients to the appropriate area. Um, and really, really critically, when you look at the data from, from that phone line, 42% of the calls that we took resulted in a patient not coming to hospital. So those patients were either reappointed somewhere else in the system um, or they were able to be safely managed at home. Um, when you look at our occupancy in terms of, of inpatient beds, uh, this has got to be a reason that it's, it's been a lot lower than we had anticipated. Um, I also see we've had over a thousand patients through Ward 42. Ward 42 before COVID, um, was our, our infectious diseases unit. Um, people would come in, they would stay sometimes for a long period of time um, and it did not see anything like that level of activity. So the team on that ward have to be hugely commended for the way they've stepped up to manage that completely different patient flow through their area. Um, peak number one, we had on the 6th of April. On that day, 105 occupied COVID beds and we took 36 admissions through Ward 42. Now, Ward 42 only has 16 beds. So they turned that entire ward around during that 24-hour period um, with some patients who were 
were really quite unwell. So again, a huge bit of work. Um, in order to signpost people to the right places, we've had to develop patient pathways. Now, this is the one for medicine that I've shared. Uh, a similar looking document exists for many different parts of the system, but they all follow exactly the same principle in terms of separating the patient streams. Um, we know you've got COVID and you need to come to hospital. We know that you've got COVID and you probably don't need to come to hospital. We don't think you've got COVID or really you, you shouldn't be anywhere near a hospital anyway. Um, we've tried to share these as widely as we can. They're on staff net. We've shared them with our primary care colleagues just to, to be able to make sure that everybody is working off the same the same baseline um, and the principle throughout COVID has remained the same. If you need to come to hospital, we'll admit you into an isolation facility, we'll test you and then depending on the outcome of that test, you will either go to a downstream ward if you're negative or you'll go into one of our COVID cohort wards if you are not. Um, a significant part of the work that came early 2020 um, was scoping out and equipping Ward 42 to be able to deliver um, level two and actually level three care for an, indeter an indeterminate patient. Um, we re recognised that patients might present really quite unwell and we had to be able to safely manage them in isolation while we determined their COVID status rather than risk contaminating an entire level two or level three unit. Um, so March wasn't quite over by that point, we opened the unit and then the very next day our thoughts turned towards staff testing. We realised quite quickly, um, looking at the guidance that was available at the time, that there was a potential that we would actually lose more staff to isolation as a household contact than we would to COVID. So we had focused up until that point on keeping our staff safe in terms of ensuring their PPE, ensuring our um, patient pathway, making sure our infection control standards were extremely tight, um, but that wasn't going to be enough to protect them and keep them at work if they had a household contact that meant they had to isolate. So the community testing team that we successfully established earlier on in the COVID response um, had been stood down when the HPS guidance changed that we didn't have to test well people. So they were rapidly repurposed to be able to provide a testing function for staff. Now, at that point, um, staff testing hadn't been hadn't been mandated by the government it hadn't been approved by the government and um, the medical direction nurse director in Tayside when presented with a proposal of how we could safely manage that were supportive and staff testing for rota critical clinical staff was commenced on the 17th of March um, by the 20th of March, we'd reviewed our pathways and our footprints further. Um, we'd established a dedicated bay in the emergency department to accommodate COVID possible children. Um, because again, we had, we had to have a stream to be able to isolate and treat them safely without potentially contaminating um, a paediatric ward. And by the end of March, we also had a clinical lead identified for a testing function. And, um, to make sure that we had the appropriate governance around our results and um, we began to start tracking data on our staff testing as well. Um, moving into April, you know, continual review of our patient pathways. We received some excellent feedback on our staff testing. The NHS Tayside testing team have tested over 5,000 wor uh, key workers since they started testing, so over that 10 week period. Um, focus initially obviously on NHS Tayside staff to keep them at work and keep our clinical services safe but we've also tested staff from the police, the fire service, the ambulance service. Importantly for them at the time as they were experiencing a crisis were staff from Perth Prison to allow them to continue to safely deliver their function and more recently care home and care at home staff as well and their household contacts. So some of our take-home messages from our very early response to the COVID-19 pandemic in Tayside. Bessie Mukar, ID clinical lead, has reminded me of this one numerous times throughout our experience. Rule number one of a pandemic, don't deviate from the guidance. If you don't agree with it, if you think it's silly, the guidance is the guidance and you'll be Are you still there? I've 